Jean-Paul Sartre wrote, Although Calder has not sought to imitate anything, his one aim is to create chords and cadences of unknown movements. His mobiles are the tangible symbol of nature. That nature of which we shall never know whether it is the blind sequence of causes and effects or the timid, endlessly deferred, rumpled and ruffled unfolding of an idea, capital I. I think this is a masterful explanation of the ability of art to convey two different possibilities in a single piece, what Elizabeth was referring to, the kind of work that Ibn Arabi does. You can literally show them both in one object. Little private celebrations, Sartre called these. Is the world around us a random sequence of events or is it covering up a grand idea? Uh, just as a footnote, I came across this quote at an exhibition of Calder's works in Los Angeles last month, and an elderly man standing next to me was sort of rubbing his head and going, do you understand what he's talking about here? And I said, well, I think it might mean, and he said, well, do you think, and we talked for about 15 minutes on this subject. There's not many places in everyday life where you can have that kind of conversation with complete strangers, but art does that. Uh, these images are chosen specifically because they're artists whose work I've seen in the last year. It could have been any number of them. And I find myself, with, it seems, an increasing number of others, visiting museums for sheer pleasure, engagement, enlightenment. According to a recent article in The Economist, headlined Temples of Delight, museum building and museum attendance has increased rapidly over the past 30 years. In 2012, American museums received 850 million visits, more than all the big league sporting events and theme parks combined. Half the adult population of England visited a museum last year. China is building literally thousands of new museums, several serious museums have gone up in the Gulf states. 20th century modern art is attracting an increasing following. Five million visited the Tate Modern last year, and MoMA in New York is one of the most visited American museums. The article suggests people are looking to museums for guidance, but not for answers, and that museum directors are increasingly aware that they need to engage the visitors rather than to lecture them. The Los Angeles County Museum this year mounted one of three major exhibitions of recent work by James Turrell, an artist who has spent most of his life working directly with light alone trying to eliminate even the forms that light falls on so that we can see ourselves seeing. If the light falls on an object, he says, we see the object, and our previous perception prevents us seeing things as they really are. He wants to try and eliminate prejudiced seeing. This is one from the Guggenheim. This one is called Bridget's Bardo. His grandest project harks right back to our earliest ancestors, creating a naked eye observatory at Rodin Crater in the Arizona desert. Not this time to provide answers to our place in the universe, but to allow a profound and personal engagement with the sky, sun, moon, and stars from a private position. This is an extraordinary project that he's been working on for 20, 30 years now. He's carved out the center of this crater and created these 
separate rooms that you can look at particular um, sunrises, sunsets, moon, and just look at a particular patch of sky for a period of time. Sadly, not open to public yet. It would be too glib to call the modern scientific approach atheistic or modernist art agnostic. Scientists and artists themselves have much that's interesting and various to say on this subject. But both do require a putting aside of belief to increase perception and knowledge. We have been educated by these modernists, whether we're aware of it or not, and we do owe a huge debt to them. Time and exposure has not only made it easy to love Impressionism, but also to be comfortable with not knowing what later and more inscrutable works of art mean. We've been encouraged to open our eyes and let the light in, and not require an answer. And this extends throughout the arts. Musicians threw out melody and fixed rhythms so we could hear sounds in a different way. Architects broke with traditional orders so we could re-experience space and light. Dancers looked for movement from an internal core and not an external order. Writers loosened narrative and plot so they could examine the unresolved and the absurd and the sheer complexity of words. On or about December 1910, human character changed, Virginia Woolf stated hyperbolically. <laughs> Relations between masters and servants, husbands and wives, Parents and children shifted, she said. And when human relations change, there is at the same time a change in religion, conduct, politics, and literature. I don't know what happened specifically to Virginia Woolf in December 1910, but she was clearly on to something. Because along with dramatic scientific advances and radical artistic upheavals, there has clearly been, in the West at least, major changes in human relations since then. If the 20th century witnessed genocide on a scale never seen before, it also, in counterpoint, produced the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and an ever-expanding understanding of what this might mean. And if religion or belief needed to be put aside for scientific inquiry and artistic breakthroughs, it has often had to be circumvented in issues concerning morality and social justice. The civil rights movement, of course, was strongly rooted in the black church, though it's also true that the Bible had given plenty of textual cover condoning slavery and apartheid. Liberation theology, which mined Catholic teaching to understand the roots of poverty and shift the consciousness of the poor, was also roundly silenced by the Catholic Church. The women's movement, the gay rights movements, have had to work very hard to overcome where they have done so religious doctrine. And it's interesting to note that in recent surveys, political surveys in America, it indicates quite clearly that the rapid increase in acceptance of gay relationships within even quite conservative religious communities has come about when it has through personal contact. So love of humanity over and over again can transcend religious doctrine. And knowledge of what is precedes what belief in what should be. These days, there is no shortage of critique of religion. Atheism and agnosticism 
quietly a part of the critical dialogue for the past 150 years or so, have burst out of the closet. In the last 20 years, with a stream of books, articles, debates between atheists and believers, lectures on the incompatibility of science with religion. What is new, Adam Gopnik in The New Yorker wrote just this week, is, quote, a tone frankly contemptuous of religion. The aforementioned books by Dawkins and Hitchens, which I personally found irritating, simultaneously barking up the wrong tree and flogging a dead horse, <laughs> They each trotted out well-known examples of the evil done in the name of religion and the incomprehensibility of religious tales and supernatural doings. And they both managed to dismiss 40,000 years of human engagement with transcendence by almost all of our human relatives as delusional. Boiled down, though, the principal point of both these best-selling atheists would seem to be that the God of religion is created in the imagination of the believer, which then becomes their authority figure. This subjects the believer to dogmatism and strips them of responsibility for their actions. Ibn Arabi, whose magnificent book of poems, The Tajaman of Ashwak, produce the title of this talk, would entirely agree. Ibn Arabi, living in the Middle Ages, when the sun and the fixed stars apparently moved around the earth, the devout Muslim, devoted follower of the Prophet Muhammad, steeped in the revealed text of the Quran, said, agreeing with these pompous atheists, God conforms himself to the belief of his servant. Whoever believes that God is such and such, he appears to him in the form of his belief from the Futuhat. Take care not to be tied by any particular belief while denying all others, for much good would escape you. In fact, knowledge of how things are would evade you. Truth reveals itself in the imagination, says Ibn Arabi. This is the realm where forms take on meaning and meanings descend into forms. Many scientists and artists would, I think, agree with this. But if the access to the imagination is filtered through pre-existing belief, or if it is colored by projections or fantasies or hopes or fears or history, truth cannot appear as it is. It's precisely because we create God or truth in our belief that Ibn Arabi demands an emptying of belief a removal of conditioning so that we can see the truth as it is, not how we think it should be. The responsibility of the believer is in keeping the heart pure, in not attaching to belief. And so long as we are unable to do this, we will be serving a God of our own projection and therefore under an authority which is not real. And this applies to everyone, whatever their belief, or their lack of belief, or their uncertainty. However they think the world is, it appears to them that way, and they have difficulty seeing it another way. The universe is annihilated and recreated at every moment, claims Ibn Arabi, breathing in, breathing out. Meaning appears and then is erased, and then appears again in another form. This finds resonance in the profession of faith of the Muslim. There is no God but God. There is no God but God. The Tajman al-Ashwak, the interpreter of desires, 
is a series of poems written in the classical Arabic tradition, extolling the beauty of the beloved in the meeting around the campfire in the desert, and then lamenting her departure in the morning as the camel trains depart, leaving nothing but traces in the sand. The beauty only remains in the heart. This is not a million miles away from Matthew Arnold's lament on Dover Beach. In spite of all he says is lost, his love remains and truth is still the object. So what then is the belief of a heart capable of every form? If we leave aside the origin stories, the promises of life after death, the miracles of the chosen ones, the prescriptions for right behavior and the punishments for wrong, there seems to be an essential element to all belief, which is that the quest for truth, beauty, goodness, however it's described, the quest is reciprocated. Something out there responds to something in us. To assert that this is not the case seems to me as nonsensical as saying that no good would come of contemplating a late self-portrait by Rembrandt, or reading War and Peace, or listening to Miles Davis, or whatever it is that brings you to a sense of connection. The proof for this, of course, lies in the personal experience, which is to say there is no proof. The sense of sublime, whether through religion or art or music, is so transitory, sometimes communicable, but never definable. So there's no agreement about where it can be found, except sometimes when we recognize that someone has witnessed what we have witnessed. Religion at its best clearly serves to develop this sense of the experience of the sublime and to share the witnessing, to position the believer in the best state to receive an authentic vision of what is real and what is right and provide a place, the community, in which to share this. But everyone... Atheist, agnostic, and believer has to develop their own ability to receive, has to find a method of recognizing truth, of following their own conscience. Even Pope Francis agrees that the question for us all is to follow our conscience. The point of looking at science and the arts is that they are all the result of human beings' struggle to produce authentic visions of reality. And the process of learning to recognize an authentic vision seems to be the same in religion, science, art, and human affairs. The need to distinguish between the authentic and a vision which is a fantasy or a pretension or a projection or a desire, or an assumed knowledge, or a connection with history or culture which has got stuck. The process of learning to appreciate art usually begins with studying with someone who knows something about it, looking at paintings in books, studying some more, visiting museums, unlearning what you thought you knew, looking again, till you begin to develop something of an eye of your own. It requires some concentration and application and desire to be educated and some rigor to remove preconceived ideas. As the aforementioned Miles Davis said, it takes a long time to learn to play like yourself. When the taste is well developed, the eye can tell instantly what has value just as those who had the eye saw what the Impressionists were up to at their first show. The rest of us may have to wait until the general education of the zeitgeist seeps into us. If we admire science, we'd like to think 
that as soon as a scientific truth is demonstrated, we are able to accept it whatever concepts it contradicts. If we love art, we'd like to think that as soon as a new vision presents itself, we recognize it. If we're inspired by social justice movements, we like to think we would instantly leap to the side of the righteous. The possibility that Ibn Arabi, amongst others, presents is a vision like this about everything at every moment. To be so empty of self that the truth appears in a new configuration at every moment without attachment to past forms. Scientists, artists, poets, prophets, mystics all help with this. We live in extraordinary times. Moral relativism on one side, the return to extreme religious fundamentalism on the other. But we also have available unprecedented access to the spiritual heritage of humanity. In the last 50 years or so, previously exoteric, esoteric texts in Sanskrit, Tibetan, Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, Greek have emerged and been translated along with respectful, close studies of indigenous communities, all offering multiple prisms through which to look at transcendence and the human search for it. These all help to rub off the encrusted edges of a single belief system. Scientific inquiry and the close observation of data clears up our woolly interpretations of phenomena. And artists in all fields have embarked to provoke our senses to take in the light with unprejudiced vision. This is not to suggest that studies in comparative religion or frequent visitors to blockbuster art shows will bring us to the vision of an Ibn Arabi. Professor William Chittick, in a lecture in Berkeley last year, reprinted in the Journal of the Ibn Arabi Society this month, spoke on this point. He emphasized that this much-loved and quoted poem of our title, My Heart Has Become Capable of Every Form, is written from the vision of one who achieved union with the real, achieved only by following most rigorously the prescriptions of religion. Paradoxically, the most broad, liberating, and universal vision, where the truth appears as it is, without screening, comes about for him through intense application, discipline, study, and submission. It is not easy to become a perfect man, Ibn Arabi states most charmingly in The Colonel of the Colonel. Yet he does state that this is the true potential of the human being. This is another piece by James Terrell. The vision his poem evokes is so attractive, so compelling, that it leads us on. Whatever path we take, with or without a form of religion, it requires us to access our inner atheism when it's time to abandon meanings, our inner agnosticism when we need to know that we don't know, and our inner believer when it's the moment to step back and receive, to be moved by compassion or swept away by beauty. My heart has become capable of every form. It is a pasture for gazelles and a convent for Christian monks, and a temple for idols and the pilgrim's kaaba and the tables of the Torah and the book of the Quran. I follow the religion of love. Whatever way love's camels take, that is my religion and my faith. Thank you.